It's fair to say that the last video, on computer wrestling games, was the worst selection of games to ever feature in a Kim Justice video. I mean, good lord, what an utterly freaking miserable bunch they were. I think what's needed now is to cleanse the palate a bit, and chill out with games that are considerably better. So here's a simple one. Having a look at the 32 Capcom CPS1 arcade games, and putting them in a big old list from worst to best. We can certainly have fun with this selection, seeing as it contains several of the best and most important arcade games of all time. And even though most of these games are actually pretty famous, there's also a couple of gems here that you may not actually know so well. So let's just get on with it, shall we? It feels almost unfair to start with these two games, but well, it's kind of difficult to properly rank them because they never came out in the West, and being quiz games they're kind of difficult to understand for poor little old me. They've got a nice little presentation at least, particularly the Capcom World title as it's quite set for referential, but yeah, not too much else to say really, they're Japanese quiz games, so yeah. The first more traditional game here is Mega Twins, which you may also know as Cheeky Cheeky Boys. Naturally there's going to be a few weak games here in the beginning, and for me this one's officially at the bottom because it's just such a generic platformer that doesn't seem to have anything special about it at all. I look at it and really struggle to imagine how anyone would choose to play it over everything else in an arcade. And when you do play it, it doesn't feel all that good as a platformer either. It's all a bit floaty and ungainly, just yeah. No good I'm afraid. Three Wonders is an odd title where you actually have a choice of three different games to play. A platformer named Midnight Wanderers, a shoot 'em up called Chariot, and a puzzle game by the name of Don't Pull. The concept of having three games in one title is unfortunately the best thing about it, as the games themselves are thoroughly average. Don't Pull, a block pushing enemy squashing puzzler, is the best of the trio. But the trouble here is that while all three could have made okay enough arcades on their own with a bit of beefing up, stuck together here they're all a little half baked. Beat em ups were basically the order of the day on the CPS1, we'll be seeing a lot of them, and the rather early Dynasty Wars is the least of them by a considerable distance. It's a shame especially because it's set in the whole Chinese Romance of the Three Kingdoms era, but this game is kind of a frustrating pile. It's possibly the biggest coin muncher on the list. The thing about a lot of Capcom's classic arcades is that they do tend to give you your money's worth, and you can probably expect to get through a stage at least if you're casually playing and only using one credit. This on the other hand, well it just seems to kill you in no time at all which makes for a quite unsatisfying experience. No fun, Capcom's beat em ups would get way better very quickly. Quiz and Dragons is in English, meaning that we can sort of use this to see what the Japanese only quiz games we just saw were actually about. You have an adventure sort of setup in that you roll the dice to take on various enemies, and their hit points are the amount of questions that you have to answer correctly. It's kind of amusing to go back to an old quiz game like this, where most of the questions are all about intricate details of life in the 90s, making the questions harder than ever but also kinda nostalgic. It's obviously a slight game but an amusing curio. Muscle Bomber Duo Ultimate Team Battle is a Japanese only version of Saturday Night Slam Masters that switches out the usual single or tag team action for a 2 on 2 elimination style tornado tag match. Naturally the resulting bouts are pretty chaotic, with 4 wrestlers duking it out big style on the squared circle. If you like Saturday Night Slam Masters then guess what, you're probably going to have fun here. Personally I can take it or leave it so it's only getting to number 26. Such is life. Willow is the first of a couple of tying games that we're going to be seeing here. Much like another one that we're going to get to a bit later, the Willow arcade game is totally different to the one that Capcom also made for the NES. Here we have some thoroughly okay looking and alright plain platform action, complete with silly drawings of Val Kilmer. As you can quite probably tell this is definitely not a groundbreaking title in any stretch of the imagination, but Eh, guess what, it's okay enough. 
Magic Sword Heroic Fantasy has a bit of a different spin on the usual side-scrolling action. We've got lots of short and fast levels in the shape of floors, and you pretty much always have a partner with you. You unlock a cell, they come out, and they stay with you until you unlock the next cell, tagging in the next partner, and so on. It's quite fun actually, mainly because it's always rather speedy. That said, there are others who love the game a lot more than I do. It's good, but it's not, like, great. Ah, now here's an obscurity. Kensei Magura Street Fighter 2 only came out in Japan, and it's, well, it's basically Street Fighter 2 mixed with Whack-A-Mole. You choose either Ryu or Chun-Li, fight whoever you don't pick by doing the classic mallet whack routine with some chibi bisons, and then if you win you go on to meet M. Bison, or well, I guess here Vega, in the final match. This is an incredibly rare find. I have been fortunate enough to play the actual machine at Play Expos in the past, and Replay's cabinet might be the only working one left in the UK. It is, as you might expect, a nice and silly little bit of fun, as well as being a definite Street Fighter 2 curio. The Kin of Dragons is another early-ish beat-em-up that lacks a bit of the pizzazz present in Capcom's later titles because, well, everything's just a little bit small here, but we're definitely starting to get the gameplay going. Kin of Dragons may well feel quite a bit like Capcom does Golden Axe, but it's pretty neat regardless, just the sort of game you'd expect to see at around the middle point of a video ranking all of Capcom's CPS1 games from worst to best. Saturday Night Slam Masters certainly kicks a lot of ass when it comes to presentation, not to mention having all sorts of cool fighters from send-ups of the likes of Vader and Bruiser Brody, to Mike frickin' Hagar from Final Fight. And hey, it is nice to have an arcade wrestling game, as there's not an awful lot of those out there. All that said, I can kinda go either way with it. It can be a trifle bit annoying to actually play, and it sadly can't hold a candle to good old Wrestlefest in the end. Still, it's a better game than the much less memorable sequel. Okay, we start the top 20 with Willow's Twin, an arcade game and another tie-in that is a bit overshadowed by Capcom's NES title, of course. But even if Little Nemo is an obvious classic, Nemo in the arcades is a pretty fine game as well. It's got a very charming look about it that still takes its cues from the early 20th century style of the original comic, kind of mixed in with the animated film from around this time that not many people remember. Aside from a couple of absolute banners, platformers aren't exactly the strongest games on the CPS1, but this is a pretty good effort that you may not necessarily know too well. Funnily enough, although it's an arcade game, it's most certainly easier than the frickin' NES game is. By the time Capcom released Warriors of Fate, they had their more hack and slashy beat em ups down to a turn, we're well ahead of the likes of Dynasty Wars and Kin of Dragons now. Indeed, this is pretty much the feudal Japan equivalent of a game we're going to see a bit later, Knights of the Round. It could happily be argued that this one is, indeed, a fuller game. More moves, more horseplay, better graphics and so on. It's a close one, Finn, but in the end, I have more nostalgia for Knights as I played it way more back in the day. Still, this is a definite cracker that you should definitely play if you haven't. It's time for some horizontal shooty action, not to mention another tie-in game, at least in Japan where UN Squadron was based on the Area 88 anime. Either way, yeah, it's bloody good. Kinda like platformers, shmups aren't necessarily the main genre you associate with Capcom in these CPS1 days, but we do have some real good ones and this is definitely amongst them. It is a bit of a shame that the SNES port of the game had just far too much slowdown to be really great, because it's a stunner in its arcade form. Continuing with the shooters, we've got the CPS1 sequel to the classic 1942 and 1943. I highly enjoy both of those golden oldies, so unsurprisingly I've got a fair bit of time for 1941 Counter-Attack. It's a fair bit different to those titles, it's a bit more intricate when it comes to ship movement with lots of narrow passages and the like, and it's certainly not going to skimp on the enemies when you're trying to avoid those walls either. While I don't think people generally talk about this as much as they do, say, the Battle of Midway, it's a fine entry into Capcom's World War II shooter series. Okay, this one might be a little controversial. I'm not sure people would have expected to see a Street Fighter 2 game, a proper one at least, down at number 16. But then, Hyper Fighting is a weird sort of a game. 
It's essentially an official bootleg that was demanded by the western win of Capcom as a way of countering the many SF2 bootlegs that sped up the play to no end. The Japanese win of Capcom largely weren't fans of this and when it comes to hyper fighting, I kinda see why. I think it's just a bit too fast and it's far from my favourite version of the game. Something about Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo just seemed to handle the increased speed a hell of a lot better. All that said, it is still Street Fighter 2, so it's not going to be right down at the bottom or anything. Captain Commando is up next, and it's great. One of Capcom's more light-hearted beat-em-ups, it introduced a couple of new moves to the party while also giving you the ability to jump into various mechs and administer some quite severe smackies to hapless goons. It's a fine game, and one of the best of Capcom's earlier CPS1 beat-em-up games, although quite clearly the main reason why it's landed this high up is because it allows you to play as a frickin' baby. Capcom would arguably do better with similar concepts later on, but this one's still a riot. A pretty solid game in the home on Mega Drive, but an absolute cracker in the arcade. Mercs, the sequel to the almighty Commando, is about as good as Top Down Run and Gunning gets. Mercs mixes up the regular dosage of foot pounding action with a bunch of vehicles and other assorted turrets and so on that you can climb into, as well as giving you plenty of weapons and the almighty Mega Crash for when you're in a pinch. It's a game that bites hard in the later stages, although it will happily give most regular players one stage or maybe even two for their credit. It's awesome. Varf is definitely one of the more obscure games in the CPS1 list, seeing as how it's chock full with classics, but this blighter will definitely satisfy you if you choose to load it up in main. It's another vertical shoot em up, this time with a bit more of your traditional futuristic edge, plenty of lasers and the like. Unlike a fair few of these I'd not played or even really heard of this one at all before, but it's a very cool and very good looking shooter indeed. Even though there's obviously a lot of pretty similar games to this one out there in the arcades, certainly at the time, Varf is worth a go even if it isn't particularly unique. It's just made with a whole lot of quality. Go and check it out. Ah yes, here's one I played to death. I always used to love a round of Knights of the Round, a very classic and thoroughly British beat-em-up where you choose either Arthur or Lancelot and take them ripping through various goons with names like Pike Man, Bird Man, Magic Man and Fat Man. And yes, there was another character called Percival but no one ever played as him because he was shit. I've always loved this one, I can usually get a good chunk of the way into stage 3 on one credit and I'm always happy if I've got the chance to stick it into a video, just because it's fun to capture a bit of it all over again. The nice thing about a project like this is being surprised by a game you've never heard of, and here a game called Panikis has really brought the goods. It's a collaboration between Capcom and Compile for a puzzle game that's fairly similar to Compile's own almighty Puyo Puyo, but with a bit of a twist. The dealio here is that you create pools of one colour in the well, and when two little critters are in that pool, the colour disappears and you score. They don't have to be connected, just in the same pool. So you want to create big pools of different colours, as big as possible, snaking them around each other if you can, and so on. It's really fun and addictive and shockingly it never left Japan. Even if a puzzle game isn't necessarily something I would play in the arcade, it's freaking awesome playing it now on main. We crash into the top 10 with that almighty ruthless bastard of the comic book store aisles, the Punisher. He doesn't just administer punishment, he administers gunishment, and here he does it to no end of foot soldiers and badniks in this utterly classic Capcom beat em up. There's always the odd little changes in gameplay, the graphics are awesome, there's the satisfaction when you're just able to pull out your pistol and blast these no marks to smithereens. The Punisher is legendary, no doubt about it. One of the later CPS1 games to the point where it's officially classed as CPS 1.5, this shows just how far Capcom had come with the system in around about 4-5 to five years. The next game is one that's probably a bit divisive, but I personally freaking love Forgotten Worlds. It's a shame that it never really got a port that did it justice, because in the arcade it was stunning. The spiritual successor to Capcom's earlier sidearms, this is a great little twin stick shooter with brilliant graphics and music for the time, not to mention two of the most utterly kick ass and chew bubblegum heroes you can find in a good old fashioned late 80s arcade. Forgotten Worlds is also pretty notable because it was, of course, the very first CPS1 game, and Capcom definitely hit the ground running with it. 
As you might expect, doing a Kim Justice video requires a fair amount of games to be captured. Not just the ones I'm directly covering, but other supplementary games. I always seem to have to capture Final Fight for some reason. It always somehow gets brought up. That's not exactly a surprise, seeing as this beat em up changed freaking everything and made the genre super hot for a good few years. But as familiar as I am with this game, especially the first two stages, I never think, oh, geez, gotta play this again because, shockingly, it's brilliant. There's still very few beat em ups of the time that were quite as satisfying as this was. Three awesome characters, a bunch of cool moves from uppercuts to pile drivers, and a highly memorable cast of villains, most of whom have ended up appearing in other Capcom franchises. It's justifiably a famous classic of the age. The top CPS1 shooter, surprisingly enough for me, is a horizontal affair. Usually I tend to prefer the vertical shmups, but I can't really deny the ultra high quality of Carrier Airwind. This is the successor to UN Squadron, only without any anime tie-ins or whatever. It takes everything that game did well and kicks it up several notches. Whereas a good vertical shooter is mostly about getting those power-ups and constructing a glorious wave of death, I do like a good horizontal shooter where you have to dart around everywhere and use just about the whole screen. Carrier Airwind certainly fits the bill, with treacherous feet-seeking enemies and plenty of bullets coming at you. It's an absolute blind of a game, and one of my favourite horizontal shmups. I've talked a little about this before, but I absolutely love Pan in most all of its forms. Until very recently when I discovered the absolutely fantastic Mighty Pan, Pan 3 would have been my favourite of the bunch. It's not necessarily the one people talk about the most, and I wonder if that's because the digitised art style is a fair bit different to any other Pan game, but on the gameplay front it's bloody awesome, with Mitchell constantly doing brand new and very cool things with a totally simple formula. And again, nostalgia has a lot to do with it. As I previously mentioned, I have such strong memories of playing this back in Benidorm. It's things like this that make the arcade so special, one of the reasons why so many of my videos are arcade centric. Hell, one of my commenters even shared this memory of most likely playing Pan 3 in the exact same Benidorm arcade around about 2000 or so. Needless to say, Pan 3 was always going to be pretty high. A few months ago, when I did a whole video on the almighty ghouls and ghosts, I did say that I'd never actually seen this arcade cabinet in the flesh, and that I did think of it as more of a home game as a result. This is all true of course, but the almighty quality of this title, the second CPS1 game ever, can hardly be denied. It may not be Capcom's greatest ever sequel, that title should be obvious, but it's pretty freaking high up there, improving on absolutely everything that the original Ghosts and Goblins brought to the table. The quality of life improvements are most definitely welcome, although they don't suddenly make the game a walk in the park. Ghouls and Ghosts is still an absolute mother of a game, one of Capcom's best both inside and outside of the CPS1, and one of the most gloriously playable ultra hard games there has ever been. Speaking of Capcom's greatest ever sequel, here it is. The one that, you know, changed the arcades a fair bit. The simple act of taking the original Street Fighter, cutting out the gimmicks, making everything a bit looser with easier to perform special moves and the like, and giving it a shiny new graphical and musical coat of paint, resulted in what's obviously the most important game on here. Now I kind of debated whether I should put this and Champion Edition together, but ultimately I decided to keep them separate. Of the two, the World Warrior is slightly more the at-home game for me. This is the one that kept me busy for many hours on the SNES after all. There's not much to say about this original arcade that hasn't already been said, perhaps I might be surprised that it's not just tied for number one, but I thought a couple of other games deserved equal recognition. Like this one. For me Capcom's best beat em up full stop, not just of the CPS1 period. A couple of these brilliant beat em ups ended up being far too kicking rad for the home, this being one of them, which was always a slight disappointment to me back in the day because when I first played Cadillacs and Dinosaurs, I fell in love. This is such a nostalgic trip for me. I would go to arcades back in the day to play Cadillacs and Dinosaurs specifically, often with a friend of mine who lived on the same street. It was all very 90s, to the point where we used to play Pogs in each other's porch. We'd actually previously kicked the arse of Double Dragon 2 back on his nest, and we were determined to beat this game. 
It took a couple of goes and a whole freaking big load of coins, but we actually did it. That's quite a fun memory. Childhood friends move away and memories can fade, but any time I play Cadillacs and Dinosaurs, it takes me right back. And hey, let's not forget that this, of course, is a tie-in game, and I'll champion such games forever. I do suppose that, in a list of Capcom CPS1 games, being number 2 is almost as good as being number 1, really. I mean, let's face it, the number 1 is kind of inevitable, isn't it? But it's a close one fin for being the best of the rest, and ultimately, that honour falls to Strider, another game that's etched onto my heart. And yes, again, a lot of that has to do with a brilliant Mega Drive version, but that wouldn't exist if not for the arcade, wouldn't it? Strider is just about the pinnacle of classic action gaming, certainly in the days before 3D. I mean, come on, it's everything an action-packed platformer should be. Chock filled with set pieces and teeming with enemies, a game that you can and should absolutely try and blitz through. There's no point taking your time with Strider, you just go madly forward while enemies cower at your feet. To this day, there should still be way more games that are like Strider, a title that is, frankly, close to perfect. No other game with the Strider name ever even came close to matching it. And, inevitably, we're here. Street Fighter 2 Champion Edition. Why Champion Edition? Well, I think it's fair to say that when I first started going to the arcades in around about 1992 or so, this was the kin, and the machine that was by far the most enticing. There were others of course, you had Sunset Riders and Simpsons and all that, but Champion Edition was the one that always had the biggest crowd. Playing it for the first time was life changing even if I never ended up being good at Street Fighter 2 or anything like that. And hey, you could play as the bosses. This was glorious at the time, when said quartet were still pretty mysterious, to the point where you usually only saw them in magazines or, if you were lucky, over the shoulder of some particularly good player on World Warrior. Champion Edition opened the gates to those bosses before SF2 inevitably came home, and a little code could essentially turn the SNES World Warrior into Champion Edition. I kind of miss bosses having such mystique. Now, if SF2 hadn't been in those arcades, I'd probably still have ended up in them all the time anyway, because that was just inevitable. But back then, Champion Edition was kin. Even then, you just knew that you were going to be sticking with games for the long haul. And there you go. Hopefully you've enjoyed this trip down Capcom's memory lanes. Now I suppose that inevitably there will be a similar list for the CPS2 in short order, where we'll be seeing plenty more highly regarded games. There'll be a lot more fighting games on that list, that's for sure. Maybe there'll be lists for other famous arcade boards into the bargain. We shall see. But for now, it's time to say, as I always do about now, because the video's ending now, bye for now! As ever, thank you so much for watching this video, I do hope that they're helping you through these rather tough times. If you like the video, please do like it, do join my awesome comments section, and also have a look at my social media, particularly my Twitter where you'll most often find me, as well as my Patreon where you can also find a lot of exclusives including monthly wrestling documentaries. You can also join this list of awesome people here. Alexa Jones Gonzalez, Andrew Dalton, Andy Cat, Arcade LY Webmaster, Asobi Quan DX, Brian Henniger, Chris Conrad Pritchard, D Zalior Rimwan Sutter, Dave Cork, David Rose, Dinty76538, Dustin Cooper, Gary St. Maiden, Geordie Alex, Glunfeth, Jayas Manchild, James Brown, Jace Alexander, Jeff Ladd, Lucas Kaligowski, Mateus Gramzov, Martin Pataki, Nate Milbank, Cote Margel, Renbimon, Rusty Kelly, Seth Robinson, Simon Gulliver, Stuart Christopher Brownlee, Tariq Amir, Tim Wald, Yurka Operator, and to all the rest of my thoroughly awesome community, thank you so much, and goodbye.